song when we see him face to face. Well, Miss Linda was uh, at her brother-in-law's funeral on Friday morning and went to the house to have a meal with the family and she fell and broke her shoulder. I don't know what it is about our preacher's wives and their limbs, but boy, I tell you, Jimmy is out sick. Britt is sick. And I've been without chocolate 12 days and I've... And I've lost hearing in my left eye, so I am, I'm having troubles. Marina, I apologize to you, but we're going to just set our sermon aside this morning. Turn with me, if you would, to John 14. I have no idea where we're going to go with this. So let's do this. Now, Wednesday night... Uh, the Eight Purposes of Trouble, we'll be looking at that, so the notes that she has, we'll be back on Wednesday and we'll do that. This has been a week in which we, once again, mourn and grieve, and before even the names of the children and the teachers were disclosed, the left and the right were already on Facebook politicizing the death of boys and girls. And I, you know where I stand on that. I know where you stand. We know, we know what we believe. But it's not a time to throw that in the face of anyone. It's a time for a nation to grieve. We had a former president that made an absolutely asinine statement trying to compare uh, a death of a criminal three years ago to, or two years ago to these children. And that's wrong when you do that. It's wrong to politicize a death. The... The thing I want to share with you this morning, and, and I hope we can convey the truth, is that we are, a, we are a troubled nation. We are troubled in many, many aspects, but we're going to talk this morning about heart trouble. I told uh, Miss Jan last night, I said, well, I'm scrapping everything. We're just going to read from John 14. In fact, if you found that John 14 one, I'd like for you to stand together with me and I want to share a couple of things this morning about trouble, heart trouble. When we have heart trouble, you know, uh, my brother here in a couple of weeks will be facing open heart surgery and they'll have to cut his breastbone and break ribs and, and have a valve that they'll try to replace into his heart and he'll be down for months from that. Heart trouble is the leading cause of death in the world. This year, 7 million people will die with heart trouble. Many of you sitting here probably have stents in your heart right now. Yeah, many of you do. Uh, many of you have been told by a doctor you need to be on a low-fat, high-fiber diet uh, because of heart. Those four chambers have to keep that blood moving and circulating. And basically, in 32 seconds, the heart can leave that chamber, make it from the top of your head to the heel, and back into that the left ventricle and do it all over again. We have no idea what's going on with that thing all day, all night, all day. Do you ever just check your heart to make sure it's still, still going? How we thank God for the, for the mysteries of, of the body. But we're going to talk about the other heart trouble. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is the first time that Jesus is addressing this great sorrow that is about to happen. He, he is taking time as he recognizes that the disciples now understand what's about to happen. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, 
that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And I love Thomas. Thomas brings out the us in, in every situation. Hey, Lord, wait a minute. Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, this beautiful symphony of words, Thomas, I am the way. Father, help us this day. As we grieve, not teachers, we grieve uh, the very thought that life can be so cheapened and so politicized. God, help us. We thank you for boys and girls. We thank you for the precious teachers, workers, bus drivers, and kitchen crews, and maintenance folks that try to take care of boys and girls. Every teacher in this room has visualized what would, that, what would happen if that happened. We thank you for life, and we thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Three times Jesus mentioned his own heart trouble. Three times. We're in John 11. In John 11, he says, as he sees Mary and Mary coming toward him, I'm cutting in and out. Roger, am I doing something wrong? I'm cutting in and out. Am I doing something wrong or is it, is it me? Um, three different times. He sees Mary and Martha coming and he looks at them and he says he begins to cry. And then it says that his spirit was troubled and Jesus asked the question, where is he? He's talking about Lazarus. And we know that he stood there looking at the death and he grieved. The next chapter in John 12, he told his disciples that he was about to die. And they still don't get it. And it says, now my soul is troubled. Now my soul is troubled. The very next chapter in John he says it again he sets them all down and he he presents to them as he washes their feet and he sets them down for this little symbolism meal that he's shared with us that 2,000 years later we still do and one of the disciples looked at him and and said well who is it that's going to betray you and it says of Jesus that his spirit was troubled his heart was troubled so even Jesus, Son of God, all God yet all man, all divinity and yet all humanity, at the same time, this same Jesus not only cares about the big things and the big pictures of life, he cares about the, the small pictures of life as well. And he recognizes these guys are hurting. Mark Batterson in his book asked the question, what if the future that God wants for you right now is hiding in your biggest problem?" What if the future God has for you is in your worst failure? What if it's in your greatest fear? So this morning we look at heart trouble. And just a couple of words about heart trouble from John 14. Maybe three things. There is a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a living uh, person through the Holocaust. His mother and father were there. They were killed in the Holocaust at, I think at Auschwitz. He lost a sister in Auschwitz. And he writes in Men's Search for Meaning, they took everything from us. They stripped us of our clothes. They took my picture of my family. They took all of my personal belongings. They took my name and stamped a number, which was 119104. They took everything. But Frankel goes on to say, but one thing the Nazis could not take away. Everything can be taken away except for one thing. The last of all human freedoms. The choice of one's attitude about any given set of circumstances. And that's what I want to talk about in our heart trouble. Because you see, when you look at a situation like we have seen this week as it unfolds and everybody decides which side of the argument they're going to be on and all of these quippy sayings from the right about what guns do and da -da, and I get it, I believe it and hell, it's just not the right time. It's not the right time for the NRA to have a big celebration today. It's just not the right time. 
life is more valuable than all of our beliefs and the things that we hold dear. Life is given by God. So Frankel said, to choose one's attitude is the one thing you cannot take away from anyone else. When I sat on the Golan Heights, right on the Syrian border, we had our television crew and I interviewed Holocaust victim after Holocaust victim. I understood nothing that was saying. I would ask the question and the Russian translator would translate because they were all Russian Jews. And then they would begin to tell their stories. They would break down. We'd have to stop time after time, stop the camera because they couldn't go on telling that story. And we would stop and have a little meal and they would move over and we'd set another one up in the set and we'd start another story. But the thing that I took away from that more than anything else was when I, w- I would touch their arm, all on the forearm, where those numbers. And for most of them, because most of them were in their 80s and their 90s and were, were children when that happened. And I would touch that, that number. They took their name away and they were called for the rest of that endurance of this number. To choose one's attitude, though, about the circumstance that you are in is a freedom that no one can take away from any of us. Go with me to John 14, then. The most important choice you're going to make every day is your attitude. Attitude every day is the most important thing. Now, think about this, because you do not know what's going to happen. A few days ago, I sat, uh, just uh, go to Rosebud and hang a left. Like you're headed towards Cersei, then hang another right and back in the country about five miles. And I sat with a man who is dying. He has very, very short time to live. He's in a wheelchair, can't move. And he doesn't believe he's going to go very far. My only encouragement to him was, and I may, I may go before he goes. But my only encouragement to him was, you're going to have to trust the Lord. Because the day and the time is not for us to know. The how is not for us to know. I often talk to my son, was it a hard shift? And he'll talk about things that he had to see. Scott Cresswell and these guys that are always on uh, seeing things that the rest of us just close away from our mind because we do not want to see what uh, first responders have to see. And they try to blanket it out. But our attitude and the choice that we get up every day saying is, okay, world, you can take everything away from me today, but you cannot steal my attitude of joy if I choose to have joy. And so here's what I'm saying to you. Your internal attitude is more important than your external circumstance. Every one of us are in a circumstance today, are we not? are facing something that may cause us to have to have a certain attitude. And I am telling you that your internal attitude about it is greater and more important than the circumstance that you find yourself in. There was a great study done by a professor that I was reading about, Professor Medved. And she did a long study about bronze, silver medalists from the Olympics. And quantitatively, the bronze medal holders were happier than the silver medal holders. And I'm thinking, well, why would that be? Because if you look at your circumstances and you're standing there on the platform and you look over there to the right and there's the bronze medal holder, I beat you. I'm happier than you, but it's not. I mean, across the board, the bronze medal holders, and here's why. The gold medal stands there saying, I'm it, I won. The silver medal looks over there and says, you just beat me by about 180th of a second. The bronze medal looks to the left on both of them and says, whoa, I almost didn't get nothing. I'm just happy to be here. That's why they were happier. See, so if you were looking at the objective circumstance of what you may be under, you would say, well, that's what's going to create whether I'm happy or not. No, no, no. The internal attitude about where you are, what you're going through, what God is going to do is more important than the mess that you're in. Does that make sense to you? Mark Batterson of National Community Church there in Washington, D.C. tells a story about 
he had a ministry going and there was a guy from Nigeria that was there in his mid-60s. He had had several strokes and it had affected his motor skills and he could barely talk and they could barely understand him. But he was getting uh, this religious education to go back to Nigeria to help in churches there. And Mark said, I would walk with him up the steps and uh, to, to the building to start the course. Uh, and it was like a pain because every step was a challenge to him. Every step. And he said, I would hold him on the way. And he said, oftentimes he didn't have a ride. He lived in the low rent area of Washington, D.C., had no money on his own, usually had to take a cab or try to walk or hitch a ride to get to his classes so he could go home to Nigeria and help his churches. And he said, I would have to take his right leg. When he'd get his left side of the body in the car, I'd have to take his right leg, pick it up, and just push him down into the car to get him there. And he said, one day I went, I said, I'll pick you up in the morning. And he said, coming out of the low rent housing tenement place there in Washington, D.C., here he, here he came out. And he said, he had a cap on that day. And he said, I just put my head down on the steering wheel and cried. Because the cap said, God is good. I want you to see today, I don't care what situation you're in, what circumstance or who you're mad at or who's mad at you or how your feelings are, are uh, hurt from the inside or there's an emotional scar or just the flat physical pain of your life. The heart trouble that we experience today is not because of that. It is because of the attitude that we begin to capture and keep. And so when we look at this thing from John 14, this is where Jesus divulges this thing. And I want to give you the, the first truth that you can write down. Let not your heart be troubled. Heart trouble, heart trouble. When you can't see anything else, you can trust his presence. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You know what this is saying? You are believing God that you cannot see. All of the Jewish life, all of the Old Testament, everything about the Old Testament was about the presence of God. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong, of good courage. Do not fear, be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And the Jews of the Old Testament hung on, hung on to this one principle, one dominating principle. He will not leave us. And so when they would come to the Red Sea, or they would come to a place of nothing to eat, or when they would come to the place, nothing to drink. They were reminded that the internal attitude about what they were in was more important than the lack that they were sharing, whether it be food, water, raiment, or just physical pain. So Jesus says this, we can trust his presence in our life. The answer to God's presence in our life when we have heart trouble is to trust him. You believe in God, you can't see him. Now you're believing me because you do see me, but wait a minute, you're about not to see me again. You're not going to see me again. And that's why they're sad. Jesus brings this trouble right back up. You're not going to see me again. And that makes them even more sad because they don't understand what's next. There were families, mothers running towards a school this week that no cops were going to stop that no barred doors were going to withhold. There's nothing stronger than a mama's love for a child. You don't believe that, go to messing with mama bear. We can trust his presence. You're going to have to trust his presence in your life. If I could just see him, because that's what they were saying. Lord, we see you now. We believe in you. This was the whole Thomas syndrome. I'm not going to believe unless I do what? If I get to touch the nail prints, if I get to put my finger in his side, I will know that he has resurrected from the dead, and then I can trust him. Last week, we talked about eight days later. It took eight days for that to progress to the point that Thomas said, my Lord and my God. But he had to do this. He had to feel, see, touch. You cannot trust your feelings. You trust his presence. You trust his presence more than any feeling. You can trust his presence. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe, so keep on believing. You believed, so keep on believing. What's the answer? Keep on believing. But I don't feel well. I understand that. Keep on believing. I'm in a mess. I understand that. Keep on believing. 
Do not reach a point in your place in the life where the cir- external or the internal circumstances are beginning to say, I don't know where God is in this mess. Now, you know what the question of the world is. All you Christians today, where was your God? I hate that question. I cannot answer it unequivocally, but I can tell you this. If we don't trust his presence when the shots are being fired, if we cannot trust his presence when the pain is coming, if we cannot trust his presence in the middle of a family crisis, in the middle of church crisis, job crisis, school crisis, whatever it is, we must trust his presence. Are you doing that today? Are you trusting in the very presence of Jesus Christ? The reason I changed my mind about the sermon was not the sermon wasn't good. I worked hours on that thing. Labored, walked, set up at night. Hmm. But what's important is the Lord has a truth for us this morning that I was not aware of. I have to trust his presence more than I trust the slides. You have to trust his presence in your life more than you do the circumstances that got you there. Now, if you cannot trust his presence, my folks, he is saying, look, look, I know that this is going to be hard for you to take. And none of us like change. Right? I know, I know we all say we like change, but we don't like change. A couple of years ago when we got the trailer, and, and <clears throat> it's, it's unusual, I was speaking last, or Monday night a week ago at Southside Baptist Church here in town. A beautiful crowd. Many of y'all were there. But anyway, <clears throat> the pastor before I got up there said, well, how long have you been at Mountain Top? I said, I think a, a couple of years now. Did you know that today marks the third anniversary of me being here? Is that possible? I know you're clapping for Jan. I get it. Three years? I thought it was two. But COVID wiped out something in there in my, in my mind. We didn't come to July, but we came on the, this week in May, three years ago. My point to that is this. Um, COVID hit. Uh, we put a trailer here because it couldn't be anywhere else. And uh, Mountaintop Danny and uh, Wayne and I think Daniel maybe. We, we, bought this bed. we bought this bed from the recommendation of our chiropractor who come to find out had never slept on it. He just kept hearing it was really good. <laughs> that bed's so hard. So we put a pillow topper on it, but that was two years ago. So yesterday we <clears throat> changed all the bed. I said, honey, why do we have this topper on there? I don't know. She said, well, let's take it off. <clears throat> let's take it off and see. Well, now we remember. <clears throat> I woke up at like uh, after the initial 12.43 waking up and like about 1.30 in the morning. She said, what's wrong? I said, my hip hurts. Turn on the other side, the other hip hurts. She moaned all night long. I said, you want to get up and unmake the bed? And, and if y'all know what a fifth, making a bed in a fifth wheel is like, right? You do know that you make it on your knees and, and all that. So anyway, we, we don't like change. So this morning early, we put the pillow topper back on the, on the bed again. Why? We don't like change. We don't like change about anything. Jesus is asking them to change now from being able to see me to trusting my presence when you cannot see me. That's in the hospital quarters with bad news. That's sitting face to face with bad news. That's sitting in the parking lot where shots are being fired. I have to trust his presence. I'm going to tell you this. If they can steal that freedom from you, if they can steal that freedom from you, if they can steal that freedom from you, you're not going to have a chance when things really get rough and things are really going to get rough for the world, not just this country. We've got heart trouble today. You're going to have to trust his presence. Number two, you're going to have to trust his promise. Hey, let not your heart be troubled. You believe God, believe also in me. In my, here's the promise, verse uh, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, I've looked at that. Most of our songs, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday under, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are paved. And it's a beautiful song. I've sang it just like you have. It's just kind of incorrect. We, we get the idea of this promise as though Jesus has a house, and when we die, the angels have a map, and they give us the street number that we're living on, and Peter's sitting there in the golf cart going to take us down to, to where our house is. Did you know that in Jesus' culture, 
When the oldest son got married, you know what they did? They built a wing on. I think that was smart because we found out you never get rid of them anyhow. <laughs> they built a wing on. Second son gets married, a second daughter gets married, they build a wing on. And then they would build a patio. So that here's the wing, here's the wing, but they're all in the same place. Heaven is not a, a roll of condos going up and down the streets. Over in Revelation 21, 16, it talks about heaven being four squares, pictured as a square cubed. If you do the math, that's 1,500 miles this way, that way, this way, and that way. If you cube that, that is 3 billion. 375 million cubic miles. You cannot fathom how large that is and how many of God's people in a glorified body can get in this one place and sit around the patio at night. This is a promise. You have to trust his promise. I'm going to trust in the promise. He said, look, I'm not leaving you because I don't like you. And if you think about it, I'm not leaving you because I don't like you. Can you name all the people that you've walked away from or left because you didn't like them anymore? Are you, are you all friends anymore? Not, not really. Why? I don't like them. I'm not leaving you because I don't like you. Listen to this. I am leaving you to go and prepare this place for you. Now, how does that happen? We know that the, that the Lord made the universe and everything in it in how long? Six days. Set down because it was over. And yet he is telling them, as he left 2,000 years ago, I've got to go and prepare a place for you. I'm not leaving because I don't like you. I am leaving because I'm going to prepare. I don't know what that means, but I know it's a promise for me. And I'm going to trust that promise. I not only trust his presence, but I trust his promises. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, listen to this little phrase, I would have told you. You can trust his promises. Redemption comes to you not because you want it to. Being saved doesn't mean, okay, uh, I've got some problems, so I need to get saved. Or my cousin's got saved, so I want to get saved. Redemption comes to us because it's the greatest need of our life to have a relationship with God. Sin has separated us between God and ourselves. Jesus came as the mediator between God and man. And when he died on the cross, his presence then was no more physically, but he gave the Holy Spirit to be the comforter, and he sits on the right hand of the Father. You say, explain that, preacher, I just did. As good as I can. I don't understand it, but I trust his presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. What makes us a fellowship in the church? What makes us fellowship? What, what makes us be of one mind, of one spirit? And see, the moment they turn those microphones on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, uh, there's uh, 9,000 miles of cord right there, 19 microphones, monitors, everywhere you got there's sound potential everywhere and when they turn it all on and they all pray you notice that they pray here and they pray back there you know why they're praying because the devil gets in sound systems the devil gets <laughs> amen all the sound men said amen <laughs> what worked it worked perfectly last night everything was perfect but now it won't work that is the nature of that that's not what creates it uh, that hey it all worked today thank god what makes us a unity, what makes us be of one mind, one heart, one body, one soul, one baptism is the presence of Jesus Christ and the promises that he has made that this is not it for us. This is not it for us. I cannot explain to you how a madman can walk in and kill innocent children. I cannot explain that. I do know that any law, there will be never enough laws that you can make because he broke more than 18 different laws before he even hit the, hit the door. You cannot create enough laws to stop evil you will never stop evil this is down to god and the devil jesus christ and the devil this is the fight that's been going on since the inception of time but i'm going to tell you you can trust not only his presence you can trust the promise if it were not true i would have told you now is that where you are today in your life trusting in the promise 
Because it's not just the man over Rosebud who knows he has a few days to live. It's you too. If you knew you had three days to live, my friend, you would have a perception of life that would be different than everyone else. And that's why you're not going to know. And everyone is saying, oh, please tell us, what is the time? And that's what they asked Jesus. Give us the time. Give us the time. Tell us when you're, tell us when you're coming back. He says, it's not, not for you to know. You don't need to know that. All you need to know is I'm going to prepare a place for you. You can trust that. You can take it to the bank. You can trust the promises of God. Your salvation is not because of your, your goodness or your family lineage or your grandfather or anything else. And when, when uh, part, Jay, are part of your testimony, you talked about your grandfather being a preacher and daddy being a preacher, but he's driving down the, down the road. And that's not good enough. Papa being a preacher is not good enough. Repentance of your sin, coming to Jesus Christ by faith, asking him to be your mediator so that you can have a presence with God is what creates salvation. Are you trusting in that today? Because I'm telling you, if you're not, there is no hope other than Jesus Christ. There is none. And that's why it's, it's just not that big a mystery. When the preacher in Houston was on The View and they asked him, are you one of those Christians who say that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Sweat popped out on his brow. And he couldn't utter the words. There he had it. For one brief moment, millions of people, wait a minute, what's he going to say here? And he blew it. I'm not saying I would not have blown it under the same pressure. I'm just saying he blew it. Because the answer is Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's not a way. He is the way. He's not one of the, one of the saviors. He is the savior. Jesus Christ and his redemption comes to you. Are you trusting in that promise today? Because if you're not, you're trusting in a false God and a false hope. I've told you about being in so many different foreign countries where I see paganism. I, I've, I've seen uh, pyramids and I've seen uh, steps from pyramids that go to where they would take in, in South America, take these precious babies and lay them right upon a stone, take a knife and go right into that baby's heart, cut that baby's heart and hold it up. Such paganism, such idol worship. But my friend, we have our idols in America are just, just as like those of foreign countries, only ours are more expensive. A teacher recently had an exercise, and I just read this, I think last night. She just told everybody to shut their books down and said, for the next five minutes, we're just going to talk. And she asked the students to turn around. And she said, some of the boys and girls just started chatting and started laughing and talking. But most of them turned to their device, their, their iPad, and began, and no, no, put it away, she said. Then they put their head down on their desk. They could not communicate on that level. See, when you come into the house of God, my friend, and we're, we've opened up God's word and we're talking about his, his presence in your life, we're talking about his promises that you can trust, and you're sitting there as bored out of your skull as you can be, I am telling you, you don't have the same Jesus Christ that I have in my heart that gives me a promise that I can hang on to because I do not know of what external circumstance is going to hit me this week. I just know you can't steal my attitude about what's going to happen to me this next week. Why? Because it is wrapped up totally in this promise. If it weren't true, I would have told you. That's what makes us a body. That's what, you said, this may be your first time here, and some of you I've met, the first time today. You have all the rights and privileges of everyone who's been here 12 years. Oh, no, wait a minute, I have seniority, I, I'm a charter. <laughs> Aren't you glad heaven's not that way? Because it's just going to be a big patio. We're all going to be out there in glorified bodies. I can't wait to see what a glorified body is that doesn't desire chocolate. <laughs> you can trust his promise. Not only that, you can trust his person. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, you're going to be. For I go the way and you know the way. Thomas brings up something I've never heard shared before. Thomas is saying, knowledge stops at death. Lord, I don't know where you are going, so how in the world would I know how to get there? There is no road map to where you're going. Knowledge stops at death. Experience death, so how do we know? How do we know? 
I have attended and done more funerals than I have no idea. No idea. I have a pastor friend who after a tornado in Oklahoma back in the 80s, he did 17 funerals in about four to five days. He was mixed up. So many funerals, so many people, da-da-da. We worked in uh, Hurricane Katrina. And part of the job of some of those first responders there, once the flood tide rolled into downtown New Orleans, they would mark X's. A certain color X meant that this house was closed off. But body after body after body floating in the flood. And the things that they saw and the promises that, well, what about this life? I wonder if that person had trusted Jesus Christ. I wonder if he, if he trusted in the presence of God in his life. If he trusted the promises of God in his life. Because all they see is death. Knowledge does stop at death. Jesus says, don't worry about that. Well, how do we know, Lord? I don't know the way. You can trust his person, the person of Jesus Christ, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This is what Paul said in Philippians. Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took himself of no reputation, took upon the form of a servant, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he now sits on the right hand of the Father. You can trust the person of Jesus Christ. Everything that he has said is going to come true. And that's what has the world absolutely crazy with fear. You say, well, wait, is the earth going to burn up? Oh, yeah, it's going to burn up. But it won't be because of the plastic. It won't be because of those plastic straws. McDonald's now went to a straw and a plastic over it because they didn't want to destroy the universe by putting a paper around the straw. Have you ever tried to get the plastic wrapper off the straws now? There's a little Facebook thing. Every time I see it, I put it on safe because I just laugh my head off. Little kid grabs his socks, little toddler, and he's trying to put a sock on. He's got one on, and he can't get the other one on. And he scoots around, he scoots around, he scoots around. He finally gets up, takes the sock, throws it down, pulls the other one off, throws it down, and walks off. <laughs> That's us. That's us in our life situations. Totally disgusted with where we are. But I am telling you, that the joy that's got to be in your heart will not come from the set of circumstances. It will come from the choice that you made. You will not steal this. You will not steal my attitude. I don't know how you're going to be slapped this week. Physically, emotionally. Some of you carry scars that many people will never know about and will never know of the weight. And just because you told it well doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt and heavy. But when you come to this place, those loads have to be lighter because the sound is on, the instruments are in tune, and the words are coming forth, and they are truth that remind us it's not just the promise that is, it is the very person, Jesus Christ, and his word that gives us that unity. Listen, I wouldn't fuss more than 20 seconds over the color of the carpet, the color of the chairs, the color of anything. Wouldn't fuss 10 seconds over what time Sunday schools, none of that. It's all superficial, folks. It's all window dressing. None of it matters. What matters is that we be of one heart, of one mind, of one baptism, of one Lord, saying to us, we are a family, and the reason we are family is because of Jesus Christ and his promises and his very presence in our life and the person of Jesus Christ that we trust more than we trust any other circumstance. I tell you this. If you cannot trust in the person of Christ and his word, what are you standing on today? What hope could you possibly have if you cannot trust that? And I know that fear, and we're learning that about our culture, is that it, it permeates through fear. There's 11 people in the United States with monkeypox. It's time to fear. Why? Because that's, that's what motivates us. That's what gets the crowd to moving. I tell you, you know what better make this crowd move? The love of Christ. Cole did a, a wonderful job doing announcements, got him through. But I, you're not hearing what he's saying. Kids Outdoor Adventure Club, okay, they're going to go here and they're going to go here. Every week they're going to go somewhere here, there, here, there, da, da, da. What do I care? I tell you why you better care. Because every time we have a boy or girl... 
And we point them to the presence of Jesus Christ in their life. We point them to his promises in life. We point them to his very um, person, that you can trust the person of Jesus Christ. Every, every camp, when you take kids to camp and they hear the gospel all day long, they're separated from all those uh, distractions and they recognize they need this relationship with Jesus Christ. They call upon him as their Lord and Savior. That's why we do what we do. Any other reason is not good enough. That's why it's important. So look down in the verse again. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. One day, my neighbor to the right in his house and son to the left and I looked up to where Paul's house was and he was welding and he was kicking a big stream of sparks behind him very very dry behind him and I said hmm Paul has caught his pasture on fire and he doesn't even know it and he's just working away and he had that head helmet down I grabbed a saddle blanket the only thing that could get in my reach dunked it in the water tank ran up behind him and I said, your, your pasture's on fire. He didn't hear me. So I start swatting and beating it down. He turns around and looks, and I wish I could have had my cell phone. The look on his face. And he looked at me and said, how did that happen? <laughs> That's when life hits us, is it not? It hits us. How did this happen? You know, I don't know. But it's going to happen. And right now, we got to beat this fire out, Paul. We'll talk about it later. And like any real person, you don't want to call the fire department. Men don't want to call the fire department. Same way we don't want to stop and get directions. I can handle this fire by myself. My son is a captain in the fire department, a chaplain of the entire police or uh, firefighters. He had a fire going in his backyard. The pine trees, the the all the sap was out. <laughs> it just went straight up the top of that pine tree and exploded. His mom runs over there. Son, we better call the fire department. Not yet. I got this. <laughs> Why? Because we're men. I'm saying, if you're sitting here today saying I got this thing. I'm not going to have to trust in Jesus or his person. I'm not going to have to trust the promises. I've got this thing. I've never, I've never needed anybody. I can do anything. My friend, you better enjoy this life because when, when you're done with it and we're having your funeral, you're in hell. You cannot make it without Jesus Christ. Amen. You're never going to make it. Amen. You're never going to make it. Let's stand together. Our heads bowed, our eyes are closed. I want you to just, and I thank God for you. You're a beautiful looking crowd this morning. Man, this bottom is full. Got a great number upstairs. A lot of folks are out sick. Stomach bugs are going around. All that stuff that just causes problems. But I want you to just pause and distract at everything. Who has stolen? Who has stolen that good attitude, that sweet attitude that you had? Who has stolen the joy? Who has stolen that joy from you that would say, it doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter how it's going to come. What matters is I trust in the presence of Jesus in my life. I trust the promises of Jesus in my heart. I trust the very person of Jesus Christ for whatever is going to happen to me. The smartest cowboy saying I ever heard in my life is, there is no education in the second kick of a mule. You knew better. And my friends, you've been given opportunity, just as I have, all your life, to trust Jesus Christ. He said, but if you just knew where I come from, it doesn't matter. If you just knew what I've done, it doesn't matter. If you just knew where, what my situation, my circumstance, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In one moment, the thief on the cross, moments before... 
had been mocking Jesus, mocking the words of Jesus. But when he realized he was dying, when he saw he was, his death was imminent, he looked to him and he says, oh, Lord, remember me when you come into the kingdom. He didn't ask him where he's from. He didn't ask him what he'd done. He just said, you're there. Repentance. Salvation begins with that one thought. I repent. So my first question to you today is, have you repented of your sins? Are you trusting in the very presence, person, and, and, of, uh, and the promises of Jesus Christ for your salvation? If you're not, my friend, where you stand right this moment, you can pray. Dear Jesus, I ask you to save me this moment. I'm asking you to save me right now. I ask you to come into my heart. I will trust in nothing. I will trust in no one but you. Lord, I know that my sin nailed you to the cross. Lord, would you swap all my sin for your righteousness? And I'll ask it in Jesus Christ's name, believing when I quit praying in the promises of Jesus. That's becoming a Christian. You're standing here this morning and say, Preacher, pray for me. I just prayed that prayer and I don't know what to do. I won't come to you, won't embarrass you, won't say a thing, won't ask you to do anything, but I want to pray with you. Is there one person who say, Preacher, I just prayed that prayer. I want you to remember me in prayer. I don't see a hand. Oh, thank you. Now then, I ask this. To every believer in this room, who stole, who stole that sweet attitude? Who is stealing the joy that creates the attitude that says it does not matter what I'm going to go through. You will not steal that one freedom that I have left. Preacher, pray for me. I've lost the joy. It's not a sin, folks. It's not a shame. We all get there from time to time. Say, preacher, pray for me. That I'll get back to the joy. I need that in my life. Would you lift your hand? Pray it honestly. God bless you. Yes, and you. Up in the top, God bless you. And yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. I've lost the joy. I've lost the presence of God. The internal attitude about what's going on is greater of importance than the circumstances that you're in. Many, many, many of you said, that's me. This would be a beautiful morning for you to just come to the altar and say, oh, Father, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Don't let me get hung up on the mess that I'm in and the mess that I've, that I've made, but let me get hung up that you're forgiving me and that I can walk in forgiveness. So, Father, help us this very day. to trust your presence, your promises, and your person. So here we stand. If you need to come this morning, this is the day you got saved. This is the day you want to follow the Lord. This is the day you've never been baptized and you want to follow the Lord. You come. If this is the day that you want to say, Father, restore the joy of myself, then you come as the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Just slip out as the Holy Spirit leads you to do.